work with some of the projects. So thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, it's my first time visiting a Department of Public Health, so we'll we'll see how we get on. Hopefully, it makes some some kind of sense. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit today about uh, various work we've done uh, on technology support uh, for, for mental health and particularly the development of online mental health pro uh, programs. So I'll start out by talking about the, the kind of problems we're trying to address to say a bit about what we might do uh, in terms of technology to address these and then talk about the whole host of problems that we then have to deal with uh, as soon as we look uh, at uh, applying technology and developing technology uh, for this area. So normally I start with some visualizations showing the kind of burden of disease and the impact of mental health. So I'm assuming for, for this audience uh, that I, I didn't really uh, need to do that. So obviously it, it's a big issue and not just for the developed world but for the developing world uh, as well. And that actually is uh, potentially uh, an area where technology can, can help us as well. There are a lot of evidence-based treatments out there uh, for various mental health uh, difficulties, but uh, you would even say most people don't get the, the treatment they need. Uh, and you can see there being two basic reasons for this. One is that they don't necessarily have access. Uh, there aren't enough professionals to deal with the, the need uh, out there. Uh, there probably wouldn't be the money to pay them, uh, even if there were enough uh, trained professionals uh, available. Uh, if you're not located in a major city, then issues like you know location can, can be an, uh, an issue. Uh, and also, if you're working or have childcare commitments, then you know it's not necessarily very convenient to, to be able to, to go and, and receive treatment on a, on a regular uh, basis. So it can be difficult to, to get access. We've got a, a second issue then, which is one of engagement, which is even when there are treatment options available to, to people, uh, they're not necessarily taken up. And a big a uh, component of this is the stigma surrounding uh, mental illness. Uh, also, it's the question of when you're, you're getting people. Ideally, you'd like to prevent difficulties arising in the first place. And again, I, I guess this is the right uh, audience uh, for, for that message. But also, if a problem is emerging, it's, it's better to get in there early. Uh, but because of stigma, people very often don't seek help uh, until they're more ill, they've had more consequences uh, possibly, which then sort of exacerbates the, the whole situation. So even without knowing anything about what technology has been done in the area, you, you might suspect technology could be helpful for these. I mean, this issue of access and kind of allowing communication, delivering materials and so on, that seems an area where technology could be useful. But also if we look at this issue of, of engagement, the potential to interact, let's say, anonymously using technology could be a good way around this issue of stigma. Uh, and if we're talking about getting people uh, earlier again, the, the availability and ubiquity of, of technology could be a good way of doing it. And also we, we might make the treatment uh, a slightly more engaging experience uh, for people using technology. I mean, much of our lives are mediated for good or bad uh, through technology uh, at this point. And it, it does allow us to do uh, some interesting things potentially. So if we're going to develop technology for, for this area, really there's you know, a bewildering array of things to, to take into account, you know, which could lead to a lot of fragmentation. Uh, and in our case, we saw when we, we started that there was a lot of people reinventing the wheel, you know, people uh, specializing in one component uh, of all of this, uh, hitting the same problems that other people kind of looking at other parts of, of the picture were doing. So we've all the different conditions, whether it's depression, you know, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and, and so on, each of which can have their, their own sort of particular issues associated with them. You know, particular illnesses, let's say bipolar disorder, might impact on the way people interact with technology, let's say this sensitivity to the promise of rewards or whatever. Um, can also have quite a complicated situation in terms of comorbidity. So we had a, a pilot happened in the UK uh, where there were immense difficulties recruiting because they were looking for these purely depressed people who weren't also anxious uh, uh, and almost everybody that was coming in also had kind of comorbid anxiety for, for example. It's also a question if we're developing technology are we developing things which are very very specific which would be the tendency coming from the, the healthcare uh, side of things because people will have a, a specialism or are we trying to build flexible tools that might be able to be adapted uh, for a range of different contexts. Likewise in terms of where we are and the, the kind of trajectory of an individual uh, patient are we talking about uh, prevention are we talking about intervention or are we talking about some kind of step down uh, care post uh, treatment. 
Likewise, what's the approach to treatment? There's been a lot of work, you know, including uh, our work, let's say, building on things like cognitive behavioral therapy because it's quite structured, it lasts for a defined period of time, there's various exercises that map uh, quite well uh, onto that approach. There could be, and I'm convinced there are, a, a lot of other ways we might use technology and other treatment approaches we might build on, but it's just not necessarily obvious how we should do that. You know, whether it's ACT or, or, or whatever else, that, you know, there are other therapies um, that maybe with the right technology and a bit of creativity could uh, benefit from technological uh, support. Likewise, how much research has been done on a particular treatment approach uh, really does influence how easy it is to, for us to pick up on what aspects of it are important and what aspects of it work and what we might then uh, translate uh, into uh, technological uh, support. If we talk about severity, obviously there's a very big difference between a kind of worried well as, as a wearer, people experiencing kind of mild difficulties or just transitory difficulties due to, due to their kind of life situation versus somebody with, let's say, long-term kind of severe treatment-resistant uh, depression. This can impact uh, on the relevance of materials you're trying to, to deliver uh, to people. Uh, we had a, a case where um, there was a, a pilot being done with, with people with uh, psychosis because very often they have issues with, with depression and it can be things like the examples that you're presenting to them. So presenting examples of somebody being worried about their exams to somebody who's hearing voices, you know, they're, they're not going to, to, to see it uh, as being so relevant to their situation even if the underlying messages uh, are appropriate. Again, the impact of the illness can, can impact on engagement. Uh, I'd say our experience has not been in line with the literature. Literature would tell you people with severe depression uh, will really struggle to engage. The, the picture is actually a, a quite a lot more complicated uh, than that in our experience. And also things like risk come into to play and how much you have to design uh, around that and things like supervision uh, kind of being built in to the technological uh, supports. Likewise, client factors, as I'll talk about in a moment, we started out looking at children and adolescents. Okay, so the way you design to support them, even from a developmental perspective, is going to be very different to the way you deal uh, with adults. As we look to scale up interventions, then things like literacy become a big issue. We started out with university students, you know, which are obviously have kind of uh, very literate and technologically literate, kind of well-educated uh, cohort. If you're looking at kind of population kind of level interventions, then uh, we have to, to take this into account. And likewise, the kind of social and cultural background of people will differ. Even the way mental health care is delivered varies a lot between the different countries. So in Germany, you have a lot of high quality inpatient uh, care, for example, whereas when we talk to people in the Irish Health Service, they're really trying to keep them out uh, of, of inpatient facilities because unless they're in crisis they, it's probably not the, the best thing for them. It's a question of what form of solution we're going to build in, te in terms of technology. Are we kind of producing adjuncts to face-to-face -face therapy to Im improve the quality of, of the communication uh, there, uh, let's say to engage children and adolescents in therapy? Are we building things to be used between sessions so there's something to talk about and to, to take the lessons from the therapy out into to people's kind of lives uh, between therapeutic uh, sessions? Are we delivering the treatment itself via technology? Are we producing technologies for self-report and, and long-term uh, self-management? Again, they're all very different and the same issues, you know, again, uh, will, will further fragment uh, what it is that, that we do uh, across all of these. When we're building technologies, typically we, we try and start with a very specific problem that we're, we're trying to alleviate. So people use terms like pain points. Okay, So what's, what's the exist problem with the way people are doing things at the moment that we're, we're specifically going to address? So if we look at things like, let's say, self-report, uh, it's a component of a lot of different approaches to, to treatment and to, to self-management also, but people generally don't do it using paper, at least uh, the clinicians we've, we've talked to. There are issues of availability of this. Do you have it with you uh, all the time? Are you remembering to do it? Is there stigma associated with it? Are you worried other people are going to find it? Our experience in, let's say, child and adolescent context, that that was very much uh, the case with. And also it's a burden, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, work that you might uh, have to do. So we might think, okay, technology might alleviate at least uh, some of these issues. If we're looking to do work around the area of online interventions, you can say, okay, the evidence is here, that these things can work for, for a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people. But in the real world, if you take somebody with major depression and say, go off and do this for six or eight weeks by yourself, they're gonna drop out. And so 
you know, that's, that's what uh, many, many uh, of these uh, studies looking at kind of standalone non-human supported solutions uh, find you get 90 plus percent uh, dropout and people are do still doing RCTs uh, of these. Very often also, poor user experience is an element of, of this. Certainly when we started working in the area, the kind of legacy solutions were, were really very, very poor. Okay, uh, could, be, could be much better. And if you do a beautifully designed three-year study of a poor technology, all you discover is the technology is poor uh, and you've really wasted uh, your time. If you look at in-session applications, um, the issue might be engaging with the, with the therapy. This is not necessarily an easy thing for people to do or to understand or pick up these metacognitive uh, skills, let's say that CBT is trying to, to teach them. Uh, we might be using uh, resources gathered between the sessions within a therapeutic session and also taking the lessons from the session uh, into the time in between. So obviously uh, I'm coming to things from a, a technology design perspective. I work in the area of human computer interaction which is really about understanding people's interactions with technologies and how best to design technologies for particular situations. So the way I would see a lot of the work we do is really in terms of technology probes. So we're building a technology really just to investigate a whole class of applications and how they might work, how they might impact uh, uh, on, people's, on people's lives. Now, I use the phrase probes, but this is not to say we're not trying to do the absolute best we can in terms of design. We're really making you know, our, our best effort to, to make sure these things uh, work, but we're never going to get it right first time. It's, it's, it's not possible, uh, and everything that's been learned uh, about uh, the design of computer systems over the last kind of 60, nearly 70 years uh, at this point is very much you need an iterative process where you learn uh, from formative evaluations and feed that data back into the next iteration uh, until you've got something uh, which is good enough. So what do we learn from this type of work? Well, you know, what are the basic issues in the domain? So how exactly does stigma sort of uh, operate or can technology uh, help to, to, over, uh, to overcome it? Uh, how exactly are people using technology? How often are, are they using it? How is it fitting into the, their lives? When are they using it? Uh, we can be learning how best to develop these technologies. We've done a lot of work around things like role play, for example, in terms of exploring the issues, even things like how a therapist would introduce the technology uh, to a client uh, might be important, as well as the kind of traditional kind of methods in terms of looking at outcomes and trying to, to work out definitively uh, what works or what doesn't. So uh, I've been building systems in, in this space probably maybe 13 or 14 years uh, at this point. So we built up, I suppose, a bit of a portfolio uh, of different types of systems. So I mentioned we start out looking, started out looking at in-session tools, particularly in the child and adolescent space. So we thought even if they act as an icebreaker, things like games and mobile phones might be a good way of engaging uh, children uh, with the therapy. If they sit there with their arms crossed, it's not good for them, it's not good for the health service, you know, uh, and uh, we don't need to be egotistical about it, maybe if it's just an icebreaker and, and that's enough. We found out as we got into it though that the technology could really open up the therapeutic space uh, a bit. It could provide a language that's used to articulate the problems and feelings people are, are experiencing. So we did early work uh, around, let's say, computer games to be used within therapy. So we initially produced a game called Personal Investigator, which was based on brief solution focused therapy. Uh, people said, that's fine, but I'm an narrative therapist, or do you have one for girls or for boys or for low literacy or you know whatever else the issue is going to be and uh, we thought that was interesting but we can't do all of this so we produced a tool then uh, called Playwright to allow a small number of subject matter experts to produce their own content that will go into the games and to be able to do simple things like swapping in and out different characters and so on. So that worked really quite well. Uh, we had just during the course of the uh, research about 10 complete games produced, one of which was produced by a clinical psychologist in UCD called Gary O'Reilly, uh, called uh, Pesky Nuts, which was a cognitive behavioural uh, therapy intervention for, uh, for children. Uh, and so that was quite, quite interesting uh, because it took on a life of its own. Gary got funding to sort of redevelop and re-implement it uh, later on. They set up a not-for-profit uh, vehicle to sort of uh, support the ongoing development. He's trained up I think thousands of therapists at this point uh, in how to, to use it. Uh, and so it's a nice sort of uh, model of, of sustainability from that point of view. With SilverCloud, we've done some other work with the Anna Freud Center around kind of flexible sets of, of tools to be used in, in this context. But that's sort of one type of uh, application we can build. 
On the left hand side there then we have kind of self-report and self-management which was the next thing we looked at. So we're looking at things like putting mobile uh, mood diaries uh, on, on mobile phones. You know, it's instantly available, you always have your phone with you, it's quite private and there seem to be a lot of motivations uh, for doing that. Now we timed that precisely wrong in that we, we were on the last generation of Java phones before the advent uh, of smartphones. So you couldn't make anything sustainable or large scale at that point because even how to install an application on a phone was completely different for every single handset and it was a logistical uh, nightmare. Uh, but really what we did get from the exploratory studies we did was that adherence was really very good. People were saying in 20 years I've never seen anything remotely like this. We tried to do a two week pilot and some people used it for a year. You know, so there's definitely uh, a seem to be mine there in terms of the kind of self-report and, and self-management, giving people also access to their own data as well as facilitating conversations with clinicians. Uh, I'll say just a, a little bit about some of the follow-ups we, we've done uh, to that. So obviously there's a, a certain burden associated with, with kind of self-report uh, but these days we're all carrying around sort of pretty powerful computers uh, in our pockets that have increasing uh, numbers of sensors uh, in them. So we did some work with Cornell University uh, on uh, bipolar disorder and a particular approach to treatment called interpersonal social rhythm uh, therapy, which is all about keeping stable rhythms when you get up, when you first talk to somebody else, you know, how much you're using technology, when you go to bed and, and so on. So this has let's say when combined with a little bit of, of self-report, the ability to maybe support long-term self-management, okay, because you're not relying on a massive amount of clinician involvement, that the technology is picking up, okay, maybe there's some prodromes, you know, for, of an episode, a manic episode coming along here, maybe you need to talk to your clinician or uh, change your medication or change some aspect of your behavior uh, at the moment. Uh, so I think that's interesting from a point of view of, of scale because it's, it's, you know, not requiring necessarily uh, a huge amount of external uh, input. Although again, how you involve caregivers, family and so on is a whole other interesting question uh, around that. We're doing some other work around psychological well-being in pregnancy with, with Imperial College uh, at the moment, um, uh, which I'll, I'll describe shortly. Now a huge part of my life over the last kind of nine years at this point uh, has been this area of online uh, interventions. Uh, and so as I mentioned before, the issue with these was, was very much that uh, dropout is very high. If you do a study out of, out of a world-class teaching hospital with all kinds of subtle supports, you can get pretty good adherence, but in the real world, these things just weren't working. Uh, and there was a danger of you know, them kind of poisoning the well in a sense of people saying, well, this doesn't really work. The thing was, they weren't working because the technology was poor. So we set about to design the most engaging system we possibly could and we went through a very intensive user-centered design process really just about make this, you know, the best experience uh, we, we can make it. Now, SilverCloud is a platform for delivering uh, e-health programs and so in a sense it's not really one system because there's a lot of design work that goes along with each individual intervention. You know, it's not a case that we just take some text and throw it into the platform and we've got a new program for depression or we've got a new program for OCD or whatever. There's always a lot of very detailed work around what interactive applications are produced, what ex exercises are appropriate for people to do, how we do behavioral activation or whatever else uh, is important in terms of that particular therapy. The other thing, and again, this is the nice thing about having this as a, as a kind of commercial uh, enterprise, is that it really hasn't just been even one platform. We've completely redesigned the whole system uh, about twice at this point, uh, and we've got some new investment kind of come, just come in recently, which is going to allow us to do it uh, for the third time. So for Silver Cloud uh, 3.0, uh, you know, which will, will then emerge in sort of uh, a, a year's uh, time. Now, this has been a, a fantastic uh, experience for many reasons, not least of which is just we've, we've got a chance to, to get it out there. So we're into somewhere between 40 and 50% of NHS IAPT services, for example, um, we're at about 90,000 patients at the moment, but most of those have been within the last year because our, our numbers have gone up pretty uh, dramatically. Uh, so we'd be onboarding maybe 1,500 patients a week uh, at this point. So that's been nice in, in terms of uh, really uh, getting things out there. So when I talk to people on the, on the health sciences uh, side of things, I suppose this is, is probably my, my key message, which is that you know interventions 
you know, using technology or anything else obviously don't work when people don't use them. And we need to do good design in order to do good science. Uh, if we do that, then we know that our studies are telling us something interesting uh, about the technology. If we haven't done our absolute utmost on the design of the technology, it's quite likely you're just going to find out about your design uh, and what's wrong with it. Now, this, this, is, this is tricky. You know, how do we, how do we design people, it's the systems that people uh, can use, want to use, will use. Um, people have been working on this, as I said, maybe 60, 70 years uh, at this point. Uh, and the key message, I think, across uh, most approaches to design, and it's all about you know, involving users in, in the process from the absolute beginning uh, and never stopping. Okay, so this is these sort of user-centered design processes. They're, they're so uncontroversial at this point, there's an ISO standard for, for human-centered design. A lot of this, funny enough, came uh, from Scandinavia, where workers were mandated to be involved uh, in any workplace uh, changes, including new technologies, and people very quickly realized that this led to better uh, technologies being, being designed, uh, taking, taking this approach. So there's a, a number of different things we can do in terms of improving the quality of our, of our designs. One is we can try and, and leverage theory uh, to some degree. I'll, I'll give a, a brief a, example of that with respect to, to self-report. In particular uh, areas, particular applications, there might be just some nice ideas we have or particular strategies we might use to engage people. As I said, standard user-centered design techniques of involving stakeholders throughout the entire process um, uh, are, are just absolutely necessary. We can learn something from formal evaluations. Uh, I spent a lot of time giving out about RCTs as a, as a way to do research, but I'll talk briefly about uh, when we, that, we, that we did. Uh, but we can learn something uh, from design, um, uh, from those kind of more uh, summative uh, evaluations. But also the luxury of having something that's used over the longer term with large numbers of people is that we've got usage data coming in all the time which we can then leverage uh, in terms of improving uh, the user experience. So here's a, a simple example, Let, let's, or a seemingly simple example. Let's consider the case of, of self-report. Okay, so people are very often asked to fill in things on how they're feeling, how they're getting on, are they doing their exercises, whatever else uh, it's going to be. We might say, okay, we'll put this on a smartphone. That seems like a simple task. We'll have a questionnaire, they fill in the questionnaire they're done. There's a question of what are you asking people about? Are you asking how you're feeling right now, this moment, this second? Or are you saying, how have you been over the last week? Okay, so there's a project uh, I mentioned we've been doing uh, with the uh, actually School of Public Health in, in Imperial College around psychological well-being during pregnancy. Now the standard thing to do uh, here would be the DPDS, the Edinburgh um, postnatal depression uh, scale. Uh, and that's a retrospective assessment of really how you've been uh, over the last week. We could also, as I said, ask people, how are you feeling right now, this, this second? And you imagine there might be some relationship uh, between them. But actually, if you look at the psychological literature, there, there's almost none. Uh, there's some classic studies, I think it's Kahneman uh, and others, looking at things like panic attacks. So when people go see a GP, 70% of them report a fear of dying associated with a panic attack. Uh, whereas if you ask them in the moment, 3% report a fear of dying. So often the, you know, the, the data can be radically different. Uh, and in a sense, it's because what you're accessing is different. You know, you're, you have, you're experiencing self that's in the moment that we've, you know, it's very ephemeral and it's, it's very hard actually. Uh, we, we have very little access to it in, in some sense. And then as you're remembering self, your reconstruction of your experiences, where, you know, which you really view toward, towards a particular uh, lens. You could also say that there's the, the kind of future self, which has disappeared from this slide, actually. Yeah. The projector, it's about perspective, kind of things of how you think uh, an experience uh, will be. And in terms of designing applications, we, we might actually be kind of accessing, in a sense, or touching on all three of these. So, as I said, there's the in-the-moment data about how you're feeling right now. There's our kind of uh, maybe... Uh, formal questionnaires of how you've been over a period of time. Obviously, that might have a role in terms of diagnosis. Uh, we might also be suggesting to people with a momentary intervention of things they could do. So again, I don't know how visible to this. This is a little ideas machine. It's in there of just you know uh, positive things somebody might do if they're feeling a, a, a bit down. So again, something we might have seemed kind of hugely simple. Actually, there's quite a lot of literature around it. The interesting thing of let's say gathering both of these kinds of data 
is that if you do them both, the, the experiences can con converge. So the retrospective kind of recollection starts to align a bit more with, more with what people actually uh, feel uh, in the moment. Okay, I mentioned strategies is another thing uh, we can uh, apply in terms of developing uh, features of, of technology. So let's say within SuperCloud we took four basic strategies uh, for increasing engagement. One of which the most obvious is just to make things more interactive. It can be a you know, very passive experience in terms of here's a page of text, here's the next button, here's a video, here's the next button, here's a questionnaire, here's the next button. If you want things to happen when you in interact with the system, if I fill in a scale, I want to see a graph, I want, I want to see some results, you know, I, I want to feel some agency uh, as I go through that. We can make things more social. We can say, listen, you're not the only person in the world going through this. You know, a thousand other people have liked this video. So, you know, simple ways. Uh, we can convey that you're not the only person. We can also have moderation systems as we do in server cloud that in certain places you might have user generated content about you know, suggestions of positive things to do or, or whatever else uh, <coughs> that it is. Uh, you might make things more personal. Not everything is going to be relevant to everybody. There's a tendency from a studies design perspective to try and railroad everybody down this kind of linear path because that'll be a nicer study. Uh, to, to publish basically. Everybody has the same experience, they do module one and then module two and module three and so on. But if somebody is not finding module two very relevant to, to, to their experience or they have it before because they've had some previous uh, experience uh, of treatment, they're just going to drop out if you don't give them any other options. So we try to give people a bit more control over the process, how they go through it, what they add to their homepage, so they have this kind of toolkit uh, of things. If they really like mindfulness, they'll add it to their homepage for, for example. Also, Having a human in the loop is, is kind of key to uh, pretty much everything uh, we do. Uh, and so this is really the route to having higher levels of engagement. So in the case of the Silver Cloud programs, they get a review, let's say, once a week or once every two weeks, where there's a trained supporter providing them feedback and encouragement. Now, there's a whole sharing system in terms of what they share with the supporter or, or not. But even if there's not a lot of interaction with the supporter, it makes a big difference to people. They know somebody's there if they need it and that, that can help them to engage. There's also an element of we'll do our homework if somebody's watching, even if you know, there's some sense of accountability, even though really we're the people who are benefit, benefiting uh, from it. So <coughs> I mentioned that a, a kind of user-centered design process where we've got stakeholders uh, involved is, is really the key uh, to success uh, in this area. So this is not without its difficulties as well. So just looking at this uh, project on psychological well-being in pregnancy, this would be a typical pattern, let's say, for, for an e-health uh, type project. So we start out, okay, we're talking to these people in public health about you know, the research problem in question, so we're interested in self-report, they're interested in uh, psychological well-being in pregnancy and something to be used uh, on, a, on a large scale. Then talk to people on the midwifery side in terms of you know, uh, how best to go about things uh, there. We then talk specifically to the perinatal depression people kind of within that, you know, to get kind of further perspectives. Then you've got midwives uh, offering practical experience, daily issues, you know, uh, case studies of particular experiences they've had and so on. And then finally, once you've got their trust, you know, finally you get to talk to some pregnant women about their experience. Now, from one point of view, you know, this seems fine, but another point of view, a lot of the design decisions might have been closed off by the time you actually get to the people who are going to, to use the system. Okay? Uh, so we, we need to be careful uh, of these uh, and be aware of these kind of issues in terms of executing this kind of process. So this would be, again, a, a sort of fairly typical model, I think, of, of how technology uh, or complex interventions overall would be developed, but everything we talk about in terms of technology would usually qualify as, as a complex as a complex intervention. Now, most of the stuff we do in human-computer interaction is sort of phase two and earlier. You know, we're, we're interested in the formative phase where we can still change everything, what it is we should be building, uh, and so on. At certain point, at certain point, then you'd go to some more outcome kind of focused trials, and then the notion is you're on to, to long-term implement, uh, implementation, and your evidence base sort of improves as you go along there. But really, if you're going to talk about technology, there's a sense in which it's a, it's a bit of a moving target. So on the left is a version of Silver Cloud that went into our first exploratory kind of study. Uh, and on the right is the version that went to RCT a number of years later. 
Now, the one on the left looked fantastic when we first built it, because Facebook looked like that at that point. Now it looks very dated. And I have no doubt in three years' time, this will be, you know, this, this sort of material design book, it'll no longer be the same thing, uh, and will look different as well. Also, because we've got so much data coming in, will it change radically kind of different aspects of, of the platforms? Now, this doesn't really gel with this notion of, okay, we do our exploratory work, and then we do our definitive thing, and then it's set in stone, and we can't change it because then the evidence is, is no longer valid. So we need to take a, a different view uh, on the way we're, we're sort of interpreting uh, the evidence that we're, we're accumulating. Okay, so um, I'm only going to talk very briefly uh, about RCTs because my interest is not really in terms of the outcome. So this was a study that was done uh, with uh, AWARE. So it was there kind of trained volunteers providing the, the human support in this case. So that's interesting, again, from the point of view of uh, a scalability. Uh, point of view. Uh, so uh, the paper is in behaviour research and therapy if, if anybody's uh, interested. The benefit for us on the design team from this was not so much the primary outcomes. I mean we were pretty confident it worked. I mean it would have been very strange if it hadn't given the, the kind of pre-post data we were seeing across a very large scale and across a very sort of wide and, and dirty cohort of every possible kind of type of, of person uh, coming in. But there were a whole bunch of secondary outcomes that were done as, as part of the same uh, study, looking at things like uh, satisfaction and acceptability uh, of treatment, some significant events, research around helpful and hindering a a aspects, as well as predictors of, of depression severity. So the outcomes were very nice. Uh, we had a large effect, but uh, and it was uh, significant uh, to the uh, between groups and maintained uh, at follow-up. Likewise for anxiety, uh, again, uh, and maintained uh, a follow-up, work and social adjustment. Uh, again, as I said, that's not really my interest. Um, okay, you know, you've got your RCT shows it works fantastic. You know, what can we learn about that in terms of making it better? You know, not, not a huge amount. From the satisfaction and acceptability then, there was a, a mix of quantitative and qualitative questionnaires. There were about 281 people uh, fill it in and a thematic analysis then done on the qualitative uh, data across these, these different themes about things like their user experience, the impact of the online support and so on. I'm not going to go into the details of this beyond to say that this, this gave us a lot to work with in terms of making the intervention something that could work better for large numbers uh, of people which is ultimately uh, where we want uh, to, to go. So if we looked uh, things like uh, perceived uh, efficacy, we can, we can say, okay, so what do people think is, is helping them kind of in this? You know, what aspects of the, the do they themselves uh, see as, as helpful? You know, is it the CBT uh, techniques, just general coping strategies uh, for dealing with, with challenges or changes to lifestyle and so on? Likewise, things about the supporter. Now, this might be sort of different coming from a technology perspective. Uh, if you do a usability evaluation, and you find a whole bunch of problems, that's a good evaluation, you know, um, because you've learned a lot and there's a whole bunch of things to fix for the next iteration. So this, again, is, is a slightly different uh, culture. So for us, some of this negative kind of feedback is, is actually useful because we can, we can try and address uh, those things then. Likewise, there was significant uh, events research uh, done uh, around uh, what moments or what particular aspects uh, of the, the experience uh, they found uh, kind of helpful. Um, I don't have time to, to go into this, but practical things would come down to things like, you know, somebody's very busy at work or they came down with the flu or whatever else, which stopped them going through it. And so that leads you to develop things like a pause feature that could people say, oh, listen, I don't want my review next week because something's happened. Can we have it uh, in two weeks' time? Well, I'll have more time to go through more of the program. And that's a whole issue around how people disengage and they finish up with treatment uh, to be done there. Uh, as well. Another luxury of uh, having uh, a lot of data on people's user experience is that we can explore then uh, what that, that experience looks like for individuals because we can look at, you know, let's say in an RCT how things people get on over a, a whole cohort but really, you know, every experience is, is unique, everybody has their own unique kind of path through the programme. So this was some work I did with Cecily Morrison uh, in the University of Cambridge. Uh, she's moved on to Microsoft Research now. Um, looking uh, at the data from uh, SilverCloud uh, clients. So each colour here is a different login session. Each circle is then doing something like an exercise or you know, uh, watching a video, reading some uh, content. 
each of the modules is along the, the side there. And if people took the linear kind of path that you know your standard study design would assume, there'd be just you know a diagonal in a sense going from top left uh, to, to bottom right. We saw instead that this kind of pattern was very common, that people would go back over the content again and again. But also, they're not just refreshing the content. All the interactive bits, like doing the exercises, you know, this would be taught to feelings behavior, sort of cycles and, and so on, mood charting, whatever else it is, they're across the top. So they're really doing the therapy. You know? they're, they're not just giving themselves a refresher on the lessons uh, that they've, they've learned. We also s were able to see when we've got large numbers of people, there, there are different kind of personas, different types of people. So uh, I, I thought this was above the first time I, I thought I, took, you know, I wrote this little visualization program myself. I don't know, I've done something wrong here, I better go and fix it. But it was just somebody had done a couple of modules, picked up a few basic strategies, and shifted into self-management. And just were only doing the interactive exercises then. Each color is a different login session, so this person has, has done hundreds upon hundreds uh, of sessions here. Completely fine. You know, from a study design point of view, you're saying this is a failure because they've only done uh, three modules. But this is somebody getting use uh, out of the technology and hopefully getting benefit from, uh, from the technology. Some people, we had interview data to go along with this, which was quite interesting because some people said, oh, you know, I saw it like a course to go through. Another person said it was my refuge from sleepless nights. And so uh, that use uh, was, uh, was a lot more uh, erratic. We also see patterns like people going literally through the program and then going back over the whole program. Uh, we see that on a, on a pretty regular basis. So, you know, given we've got potentially quite rich data coming in from sort of online interventions, we, we should really be trying to, to, to use it rather than try, just trying to shoehorn it into particular categories uh, for our studies. I played around with a few cohort v visualizations as well of, you know, how would we look at large numbers of people kind of simultaneously. And so, one thing I wanted to get a handle on was just how linear uh, people's path through the program was. So what I just did was graph what the next thing somebody did in the program was. Was it the, you know, did they go from 1.1 to 1.2 and 2.1 to 2.2, as it were? Did they go through it very linearly? Or, or did they spread out? So if everybody was linear, this is a kind of heat map visualization, there'd be a red line from again the bottom left to the top right. And we can see where it spreads out, you know, that people are kind of clicking around more. We see gaps. In this case, it turned out, you know, we could say, okay, that, that's a problem because they're, they're not doing that content. It turns out we had a lot of examples in some of these carousels. And, you know, we have these personal stories of applying, you know, what you've just learned about to, to people, you know, individual people's uh, stories. And we just had too many of them. So people weren't going to the ninth or tenth version of those. We know, okay, you know, some of those uh, can, be, can be cut out. So in the terms of getting these things out into the wild, they, they, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues. Um, if you look at sustainability, we were the first to do quite, quite a few interesting things, but you know, we, we couldn't get it out there. You do an academic project, you, know, you do your initial couple of publications, uh, you're very proud of it, and it immediately starts to age from you know, uh, the moment you do it. Okay? So a year later, the technology might even work because uh, there's a new version of some software component is out and somebody needs to go in and do some work. Likewise, do you have 24-7 support available? You know, is there technicians available to deal with issues? Do you have insurance you know, to cover real-world usage of these things? And getting things uh, out into the real world does require a lot of luck in terms of the teams, in terms of getting funding at appropriate times, making sales if you go through the commercial uh, side of things. If you want to look at scalability uh, out in the real world, uh, what's the structure of the health service? Does that make it easy? In the UK, there's IAPT. So there's a defined place for things like on, uh, online interventions to, to happen. In Ireland, there's, there's nothing like that. We're finally making some, some progress there, uh, but it's, it's been much slower. You need to have professional quality training to accompany uh, the interventions you're putting uh, forward. You need to look at standardization, treatment manuals, you know, the kind of things to make, turn it into a, a routine uh, thing to be uh, deployed. Again, if we're looking at the very large scale, there's movements towards software as a medical device. So tomorrow I'll be talking to somebody about kind of FDA uh, kind of processes uh, in terms of the um, SilverCloud uh, platform, for, for example. A lot of that then becomes about documenting the processes. So you went to talk to users. Did you document all of that? What did you record about them? What were their demographics? Uh, and so on. You've got the NHS, for example, trying to move away from a focus purely on RCTs towards having a plausible argument for patient benefit. 
Now, I don't think they're there yet. Uh, they're doing some very interesting work. We, we participated in a pilot uh, of a technology assessment process where they really got a very comprehensive probe on what had been done on the clinical side, on you know, in terms of evidence, but also in terms of user-centered design and stakeholder engagement. So definitely the bar is being raised uh, on that side of it. But also, it's, it's a very techn complex technology ecosystem we're looking at increasingly uh, as we go forward. So this would be my view on you know, where the world is, is kind of going uh, in the next couple of years. So we've got mobile devices, might be used for a momentary assessment, both automatic and you know, self-report. You might be delivering people interventions in the moment that are appropriate to their particular situation. So the question of how the health service is involved in you know, clinician supervision uh, uh, in terms of that. Whether friends and family are involved, are you pulling out long-term kind of uh, outcome uh, data from that and then feeding that back into to the overall process. So uh, we're out of time, so uh, obviously this is work that a huge number of people have, have contributed to uh, and uh, I've probably used up most of the time